did happen then. And we're taking it in the teeth for saying that. Well, he says, now that possibility occurs here, now, in our day and age, right now in our own church. Whatever the case, in the words of the Apostle Paul, those who fall prey have failed to destroy arguments and every proud obstacle against the knowledge of God and bring every thought captive to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Herein stands the great challenge of the Christian scholar. Now here's the challenge. To not only live Christologically, but to think Christologically. So there is a type of Christological living by grace we are saved. We've been told that. It doesn't matter what happens. Once you accept Jesus, you are totally saved. Norman Geiser says, no, no, there's a responsibility to live Christologically as well as to think Christologically. Well, how about it? Are we going to uh, answer this call or not? Do not allow sincerity to be a test of orthodoxy. <laughs> In the early Christian councils, Absolutely everyone, Arius, Athanasius, all of the bishops, everyone was sincere in their adumbrations of the relationship of Christ to God, of the relationship to these two, to the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth. This is an interesting situation. Do not allow sincerity to be a test of orthodoxy. We sincerely believe in the Trinity, the Christians say. You Mormons don't, therefore you're not orthodox. Norman Geiser says that won't do anymore. In spite of this radical departure from orthodoxy noted earlier, Benedict Spinoza, the grandfather of modern negative biblical criticism, insisted on his biblical fidelity, declaring, I am certified of this much. I have said nothing unworthy of Scripture or God's Word. Well, most people who are sincere, which includes absolutely all of those early Christian councils, didn't think they were speaking against God. Bart Ehrman, in his book Lost Christianities, describes the various types of uh, Christological thinking that was occurring, and every one of those people were sincere. Everybody's sincere. No one's going to deliberately apostatize, you see. Nobody is trying to understand the Scriptures through apostasy. This is remarkable. He said, Spinoza goes on, I've made no assertions which I could not prove by the most plain arguments to be true. He sounds just like the Trinitarians do against we Mormons. It's obviously true. I make no assertions. And these are plain arguments about the Trinity. And they're anything but, but they're surely sincere about it. I can therefore rest assured that I have advanced nothing which is impious or even savors of impiety. Well, of course not. Nobody seeks to be impious, but that doesn't mean what we all teach and understand and learn is true doctrine. The Trinitarians need to take a note of this. This reminds me of Fuller Seminary's defenses for keeping Paul Jewett on their faculty after he denied the inerrancy of the Bible. by See the inerrancy of the Bible. That in itself is a sincere belief, but it's fundamentally false. And now Norman Geisler is arguing against the fact that they kept Jewett's faculty position because they decided to explain to him the faculty because he sincerely believed his view was orthodox and because he had faithfully taught at Fuller for many years. Since when did sincerity and longevity become the test for orthodoxy? That's on page 18. Let me read this to you again. Since when did sincerity and longevity become the test for orthodoxy? Do you know how many Christians are arguing the Trinity doctrine has been established for centuries, and it's the orthodox view, and therefore it's sacrosanct? This is amazing. Ha! Yeah. Sincerity and honesty hardly establishes the Trinity as a doctrine either. Well, he goes on to say, One of the most serious problems for evangelical exegetes is that many are not philosophically sophisticated. <laughs> many of the early Christians weren't either. So what? What's that got to do with it? They are not trained to snoop out alien presuppositions, and I would add, like the Trinity, 
That is certainly alien to the scriptures. But they're not trained to snoop out alien presuppositions lurking beneath the surface of their discipline. In short, many evangelical exegetes have not taken the time to be aware of philosophy and hence do not know how to fulfill Paul's admonition to beware of philosophy. And so what Geisler says is, there's lots of philosophical problems going on, beware of them, but we have to become more philosophically mature. We have to become more intellectually sophisticated. Oh, was Peter intellectually sophisticated? Was James, the brother of the Lord, sophistically intellectual? What has that got to do with having the truth? The truth comes by revelation, not philosophical speculation and maturity. This is fascinating stuff, isn't it? Page 19, he says, Speaking of being philosophically informed, and this is his wrap-up. This is his conclusion. Speaking of being philosophically informed, the immortal words of Plato are applicable to biblical exegesis as well. In Book 5 of the Republic, Plato wrote, Unless either philosophers become kings in our state, or those who are now that we call kings and rulers take to the pursuit of philosophy seriously and adequately, there is no conjunction of these two things. Political power and philosophical intelligence, there can be no cessation of troubles for our states, nor, I fancy, for the human race either. Applying this thought to the topic at hand, he says, I would urge that unless either philosophers become biblical exegetes... <laughs> now see, this is the problem. The philosophers did become the biblical exegetes in early Christianity, and they brought out this silly Trinitarian doctrine. And now he's saying, well, unless either philosophers become biblical exegetes in our schools, or those who we now call biblical exegetes take to the pursuit of philosophy seriously and adequately, and there is a conjunction of these two things... Biblical exegesis and philosophical intelligence, there can be no cessation of theological troubles for our schools, nor, I fancy, for the Christian church either. And yet it is the philosophy of which Trinity is based on, and which causes the Christians to anathematize everyone who won't bow down to their philosophy of God as a Trinity. See, Jesus didn't teach his apostles to be philosophically sophisticated, but that didn't stop them from gaining the truth. They got that through revelation. Now he's calling forth for more philosophical training. He's got it exactly backwards the Christians have for millennia, quite frankly. Isn't the Christian faith that Christ produced and gave to the apostles sufficient for establishing the truth and getting it? Norman Geisler has it backwards. He says we have to become philosophically sophisticated. No, what we have to become is like the book of Revelation in the New Testament proclaims, we all have to become prophets through the testimony of Jesus Christ the Lord. That's what we have to do. Instead of turning to the philosophies of men yet and continuing still, as Norman Geisler calls forth, we need to turn to the principle of revelation. This is where the truth is found. <laughs> so thank you for joining me in this Backyard Professor Series podcast. I enjoy producing them. I enjoy finding materials for your enjoyment to listen to and learn from. I'll see you next time on the podcasts. Remember, have a great life.